Well, let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. Luke, chapter 3. Amen. And uh, if you've been here on Sunday mornings, you know I've been preaching through this uh, book of the Bible. And uh, pray for me because we're approaching the, uh, the genealogy, you know. And uh, that's going to be fun to deal with. And we'll see what we do there. So. But uh, we'll begin reading here in verse 1. I'm going to read down to verse uh, 20. And uh, let's stand if you're able to stand. If you need to stay seated for health reasons, please do so. And uh, we'll go ahead and read responsibly this morning, back and forth. I'll read verse 1. We'll read together verse 2. And then I'll read verse 3. We'll read together verse 4. I may understand what I'm saying here. Good, we got the pattern. Okay, very good. All right, Luke chapter 3, notice verse 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Amen. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. All right, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the Bible. And Lord, as we read through this, there's so many things that we could talk about. But I pray as I preach the message that you've led me to preach and the things you've led me to point out in this passage, can you please fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit? Lord, I need thee. We all need thee this morning. I do pray if someone's here today that's lost without Christ, that they'd understand salvation and get saved. And then for those of us that know you, that you'd use this message to speak to our hearts. Thank you for loving us. Remove any distractions from this room and from our minds this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In the early 1700s, the spiritual condition of colonial America was at a dismal low. One historian described it this way. New England was, a ver was very much now like a ship that had lost her way. The destitute attitude of the churches of New England from the year 1711 to the year 1735 were bringing a, quote, fearful looking of judgment from God. Dryness had set in. Orthodoxy prevailed without spiritual power and without the breath of God. The churches were asleep and only a loud voice could wake them out of it. Well, about the same time, across the shores in England, there was a man who began open-aired preaching in London. His name was George Whitfield. Many of you know his story. Whitfield had been barred from preaching in the Angl Anglican churches there. Of course, England was Church of England. And he was barred from the churches because his message, which was in harmony with the Bible, Amen. was contrary to that of the Church of England. Right. Now, his message was very clear. His message was this, that salvation was not merely a head knowledge of what Jesus Christ did, right. but salvation was through repenting of your sin and placing your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that salvation is followed by a changed life. That was his message in general. Amen. Now the Anglican Church didn't like this. On October 30th, October 30th, 1739, George Whitfield came to America. It actually was his second trip here. But this time he, he, this time he came to preach. Amen. He landed in Lewis, Delaware with the express purpose of going to Philadelphia and that he did. He actually preached for nine days south of us in Lewis, Delaware, and then he worked his way up the coast uh, into New York and back down to Philadelphia, where he preached to literally hundreds of thousands of people. Amen. In Philadelphia, he preached to a crowd of 10,000 people, more in other places, but throughout his ministry in America, hundreds, uh, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people got saved. Now throughout George Whitfield's life, he, it is said by some historians that he preached as many as 18,000 sermons and he preached as much as 40 hours a week at certain times. Amen. One historian wrote this, quote, George Whitfield's dramatic preaching was like striking a match to the awakening. An estimated 80% of America's 900,000 colonists personally heard George Whitfield Amen. preach. Now, uh, God used George Whitfield as an instrument, along with Jonathan Edwards, to bring revival to America. Amen. It was a revival that we know as the Great Awakening. Right. Now, during the Great Awakening, multitudes were saved, lives were changed, Amen. families were restored, businesses were changed, and entire towns were changed. And America during that time was brought out of her spiritual stupor. Amen. Well, at least for a while. But this morning what I'd like to do is, I, with that story in mind and what we read just a moment ago, I'd like to remind us of a truth that we find throughout the Word of God and we find throughout history as well. And that is this, the means that God uses to bring forth revival Amen. is, was, and always will be Amen. through the preaching of God's Word. That's what God uses, the preaching of His Word. Can I be more specific by saying this? Through the uninterrupted, unadulterated, and uncompromised preaching of the Word of God. You see, preaching God's Word is what changes lives and saves souls. That's what God uses. Now this morning we're going to look at a man. A man that God called. We could say that God sent to man whose name was John. Amen. Now there's John the disciple. This is not John the disciple. 
This is John the Baptist. And understand that the primary purpose that God sent John the Baptist to this world was to preach the Word of God. Amen. John chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, uh, to bear witness of the light that all Amen. men through him might believe. I'd like for us to notice a phrase found in verse 3 of our text this morning. Notice we read, And he came into all the country about Jordan preaching. Amen. Preaching. Amen. This morning I want to preach on this subject. God's remedy for man's ills. Amen. I'll say it again. God's remedy for man's ills. Ills. Now, as Luke chapter 3 begins, it's interesting, if you've been here on Sunday mornings, you understand that the narrative here in the gospel according to Luke, as inspired by the Holy Spirit of God and penned by, the, by Luke the physician, has uh, fast-forwarded 18 years. It went from the end of chapter 2, where we find an event in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was 12 years old, to the time that the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see in chapter uh, 3, uh, in, uh, in verse 20, 21, there, I'm sorry, 23, that he's 30 years old. And so it fast forwards here in the narrative from 12 uh, to 30. And we see that as we read the beginning of this chapter, that something happens, don't miss it here, in our text that had not happened for the past 400 years. Amen. Right. You say, what is that? God sends a prophet to his people. Praise the Lord. He hadn't done that for 400 years. You see, for more than 400 years, there had been no message from God delivered through a prophet to Israel. We call that the silent years. Uh, not since the days of the prophet Malachi. Uh, since that time, God had been silent. Uh, and now he is ready to break into this world once again in a special way and break the silence uh, and stir up this world by sending this man John, Praise he's going to stir it up. Amen. Well, who is this man, and what exactly does he, does he do? Right. Well, let's find out. Amen. Let's go through this text and learn some things about John. Notice, number one, the particulars of John's day. It's very interesting uh, how meticulous uh, the Holy Spirit is to tell us what's going on here during the days of John. Now notice we're giving this very, very detailed description of the time that John's ministry began and the circumstances that he preached in. And it's interesting, we are, he mentions here seven different individuals. Notice verses 1 and 2. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, there's one, Pontius Pilate, there's two, being governor of Judea, and Herod, there's three, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, there's four, tetrarch of Iturea, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, there's five, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas, there's six, and Caiaphas being the high priest. Uh, uh, notice he's telling us some things, the circumstances, the particulars that John is entering into. Well, who are these people? Well, let's look at them individually real quick to get an idea of what we're talking about. He lists, first of all, the emperor of Rome, Tiberius Caesar. Now, Tiberius Caesar was the successor of Caesar Augustus. He reigned from 14 A.D. to 37 A.D., and so that makes the year, we know the year right here, being 29 A.D., and we know that Tiberius Caesar, from the history books, that he was an evil, wicked, licentious man. One author wrote this about the man. He said, quote, Tiberius Caesar was talented, ambitious, cruel, licentious, infamous, and even inhuman. 
Tiberius would often take trips to an island off the coast of Italy. It was the island of Capri. And he would go there to spend long periods of time engaging in what is called or referred to as lustful excesses. In other words, women and alcohol and every sin that you can imagine. Matter of fact, one time he was gone so long that the Romans thought that he had killed himself, perhaps drunk himself uh, to death, and they actually replaced him with his successor Caligula. And when Tiberius finally returned to Rome, they ended up killing him but this was the leader at that time that John steps on the scene the leader of the known world then he says uh, the governor of Judea Pontius Pilate well we're told that he's the governor of Judea he was actually referred to as the king of the Jews uh, the Tiberius Caesar was the one who placed Pontius Pilate there as the governor give you an idea of what Pontius Pilate was like he was the guy that would make sure that the Jews had all paid their taxes, that any uprising or revolts by the Jews would be squelched, that they would remain in submission to Rome. And Pontius Pilate, we know, was a typical politician. He had no character. He had no backbone. He had no fear of God. Yet he had the authority to condemn anybody to death that he wanted to. And we'll see that. We see that later with the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Pilate was a corrupt man as well and ruler over Judea for 10 years. Then we read of three men referred to as tetrarchs. Uh, notice we read of Herod and Philip and Lysanias. The word tetrarch means one fourth. These men were appointed by Rome. What they did was they had certain areas there in the area of Palestine and Syria and the Middle East that they would watch over. Notice Herod, our text says, was the Tetrarch of Galilee. Philip was the Tetrarch of two areas, Iturea and Trachonitis. And then Lysanias was the Tetrarch of Abilene. So one was in the center there, one was in the northeast, one was in the higher north, and one was to the rest. Uh, and understand the, the, the Herod family, which would include the first two listed, Herod and, Herod and his brother Philip, uh, uh, they were one of the most corrupt families of the day. Uh, read about the Herod family. It meant nothing to them to slay a close relative, whether it be a brother, a sister, or a father, or a mother, so that they could advance uh, uh, politically. Uh, uh, Lysanias was the same way. We're told that he, history tells us that he he bribed his way into leadership uh, by giving a, a, a thousand talents and 500 women uh, to probably Tiberius uh, uh, to gain his position. My point is this. I said all that uh, to say this, that it was a political mess right. during Amen. the time that John the Baptist stepped on the scene. Amen. Then we see, notice the two high priests. Well, that's interesting. So he tells us about the emperor of Rome, the governor of Judea, the three tetrarchs, and then the two high priests. Look at verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. Well, that's weird. Right. Why two? Amen. The Old Testament only prescribed for one, right. and they had to be of the lineage of Aaron. Right. That was the high priest. Well, here's why. Annas was the high priest that the Jews had accepted. He was of the lineage of Aaron, but Rome did not recognize him as the high priest. Instead, the Romans placed as the high priest there in Jerusalem, Caiaphas, they installed him, and they were the only, he was the only one that the Roman emperor would recognize uh, uh, because they had him there like a puppet, if you would. And so again, uh, the scripture, Scribes of the day, the Pharisees of the day, were far removed from the word of God. There was confusion in Jerusalem with who the, who the high priest should be. And so my point is this. It was not only a political mess in the days of John the Baptist. It was also a spiritual mess in the days of John the Baptist as well. Which means this. 
That for that small remnant that we were told about in the opening chapters of Luke, that believing remnant, uh, people like uh, uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth uh, and Mary uh, and Joseph uh, uh, and Simeon uh, and, uh, and Anna, uh, uh, for those people, I would imagine as they looked out at what was going on in this world uh, uh, politically and spiritually, they probably said, there's no hope. There can't, there, there's absolutely, at least that's the way it seemed. Right. You know, when I think of that, it kind of reminds me of the conditions that God said we would face in the last days. Amen. Listen, America is not the America it used to be. Right. I wish it were, but it's not. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. God warned us of the last days and what you and I would face. Right. So don't be surprised. 2 Timothy 3 1, let's know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Notice having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. In other words, as you and I look out into this world, this is what we're going to see in the last days, and that is what we see in the last of the last days. Right. Turn back, if you would, to uh, look down to verse 13 of chapter 3. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, it's going to get better in America. Doubt it. Now, we could see revival. And we may, may get like, you know, the stock market, a little spike there of revival. But we know where this thing's going. Right. It's going down. Amen. It's going down politically and it's going down spiritually. First right. Timothy 4 says this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Can I say this? I think a lot have. Uh, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with, an, with a hot iron. Now, I don't think I, I need to get into the, I think I did at least a, a half-decent job uh, last Sunday night uh, of mentioning the corruption that's in our government. Yes. Now, I understand there are some good people. I'm not saying uh, broad-brushing everybody, but as a whole, it's corrupt. Right. I mean, in the high places, evil things in the highest of places. Uh, do I have to mention the sin of our nation? I mean, look at all the, these things that are coming down the pipe here, one after the other after the other. Do I have to mention the apostasy and liberalism that has infiltrated many, if not most, of the churches in America? Do I have to go down that route? And while it may seem like there's no hope, just like we find in Luke chapter 3, there is hope. There is hope. What is our hope? Well, our hope's in God. I get Amen. that. Amen. But what does God do right. to change the spiritual condition Amen. of a people and a nation? Well, that leads me to number two, the person of John. Amen. We see the particulars of John's day, then we see the person God sent. So what, how does God respond to times like these? This is vi vitally, is so simple, but vitally important. How does God, what does he do in response to times of political corruption, a spiritual compromise, and times where it seems like no hope? I'll tell you what he does. He does it again and again and again. He, re, he raises up men of God Amen. to preach the word of God. Amen. That's what he does. That's what he does. Now, two things about John. I'm going to look at him a little bit in reverse order of Scripture here. Let's look at, first of all, the man. Uh, let's go to verse 4. And he came into all the... Uh, well, let me go to verse 2. After he mentions Annas and Caiaphas being high priests, notice the word of God came unto John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he came into all the country about Jordan preaching. Amen. Go down to verse 4. I'll get back to verse 3 in a minute. 
as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. By the way, God doesn't need a majority. It's the voice of one. Right. Uh, crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So who is this man God? He's not just any man. Right. He was a special man. And I say that this way because he was a God called and God sent man. Right. He was the man that the prophet Isaiah prophesied of right. 700 years earlier in the book of Isaiah, saying that God would send a forerunner before the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry began to introduce Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and that man was John the Baptist. He's quoting, Luke is quoting here uh, from Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We just read it here, so I won't read it any further. My point is this, uh, John the Baptist was the one that God sent to prepare the way of the Lord. What did he do? Well, what is it said he was sent to do? He would stir up the hearts of people. Amen. He would break up the fallow ground that was there. Uh, he would be used to pierce the hearts of men, uh, to bring the proud uh, to their knees, uh, to straighten out that which was crooked, and to smooth out that which was rough. Amen. God would use this man, John, uh, to spiritually awaken the people out of their slumber. Amen. That was the man God raised up. What was the means that God used? Okay, here's John, called of God, going to use him to change people's hearts. God will. So what is John going to do? Well, <laughs> you know where I'm going. How would he stir up the hearts of the people? How, how would he break up the fallow ground? How would he pierce the hearts of men? Look at, ver notice verse 2, 3, and 4. Some phrases in there. Notice the word of God came to him, right? He received the word of God. Right. Then he came into all the country about Jordan preaching. And he was, watch this, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Amen. I don't think John came out there saying, well, hi, folks, how y'all doing today? Everything going well? You're a champion today. No, he was a, he was a preacher. Amen. You see, the means that, God, that, that John would use to reach the hearts of people is preaching. Amen. Preaching has always been God's remedy for man's ills. Now, I just read for you, and you may have flipped back to Luke 3, which you probably did, but I just read for you the, what the last days would be like from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. Perilous times shall come. But when we get to chapter 4, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy of what the remedy of it is. Right. Notice what he says, if you'll look there, 2 Timothy 4, 1. I charge thee therefore, that word therefore is because of what I just told you. I told you that perilous times will come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. I told you about all the conditions. I told you about how evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. Timothy, here's what you to do. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Right. Amen. That's what he tells them to do. The Preach the word. Why is that? Because that's how you reach the hearts of men. Amen. That's how lives are changed. Right. Because preaching is what we all, we all, preachers included, Amen. we all the need. You see, the answer to America is not trying to fix the government. Right. It's not going to be fixed. Right. Do you really think the, the tentacles of this octopus that's out there, how in the world, I mean, they're everywhere. There's no way. 
Uh, it's not going to be uh, f fixed by, by fixing the environment of going green. Uh, America's ills are not going to be fixed uh, by uh, fixing the economy. Uh, not at all. Uh, uh, it's going to be changed by the preaching of God's word. And we must understand that as a church. We are not going to reach the hearts of men by trying to water down the message to make it palatable uh, to a culture that's gone awry. And we're not going to reach them by coddling them. We're not going to reach man by tiptoeing through the tithers or trying to remain politically correct or ignoring certain Bible subjects that people might not like today. I say stop already. Preach the word. We're not going to reach men by bringing in worldly music. We're not going to reach men by lowering the Bible standard. Amen. It's not going to happen. We're not going to reach men, uh, not even by having promotions or programs or big days, and I'm not necessarily against that, or giveaways or more fellowships. Uh, we're not going to reach men by having a softball team or having yoga classes. Come on already. Amen. We're a church. Amen. And those things do nothing Right. To reach the heart of men. Glory to God. Only preaching does it. Amen. Preaching the word of God right. is God's remedy. And I'm going to make three statements here. You may want to write down. If not, that's fine. I'm going to say them anyway. Amen. Number one is this. Preaching is God's ordained way to communicate the truths of his word. Amen. Preaching is. Amen. Crying out. First uh, Timothy 4, 2, I, I read it a moment ago. Preach the word. Be instant in season. I'm sorry, Second Timothy. Uh, out of season, reprove, rebuke with all longsuffering and doctrine. Colossians 1, 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect uh, in Christ. Uh, uh, Paul said that his ministry, he says in Acts 20, 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Amen. Preacher, I don't want to hear about that, you know, those things. You're, you're getting a little too far into my personal life. If the Word of God teaches it, we, we should preach it. Right. Number two, preaching God's Word is the distinguishing characteristic of the New Testament church. Amen. I'm talking about an authentic New Testament church. I'm not talking about this liberal junk that's out there. I'm talking about an authentic New Testament church. What do we find the early church in the book of Acts doing again and again and again? Preaching. That's what they do, Acts 5.42, and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Acts 8.4, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Acts 8.5, then Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Acts 8.25, and they when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And that's just one chapter. You see, everything we do in the service is to prepare us for the preaching of God's Word. That's why we sing. But that's not the focal point. But it's important, and we should do it to prepare the heart. Uh, the, the most important thing in a church service is the preaching time. And a church service should be characterized by preaching. Well, we're going to have the worship team come up here and do a little something for us and the dance team. What in the world is that? Right. That's not going to help anybody. Amen. Number three, preaching God's word is the primary means of growth Amen. in the local church. Amen. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Do you know that the most effective discipleship program is the pulpit? Right. Yeah, preacher, Jeremy does, Brother Jeremy does a uh, discipleship program, and we're a part of that. Good, but if guess what? If you're doing that and you're missing a service, then you don't have it straight. Right. Because God has 
ordained preaching as the greatest discipleship program in the local church. The most effective counseling sessions are from the pulpit. There's no greater influence on the church than the pulpit. There's no greater influence in, to our society than this pulpit. And by the way, the world knows this. That's why they want to silence preachers. That's why they don't like when we talk about this stuff. Amen. Just keep your little faith in your little, little box here in your room and we'll get along just fine. Don't say things that are offensive to people. Uh, don't call those things sin that we don't think is sin. They hate the preaching of God's Praise word. More Amen. about that later. But that's God's means of reaching the hearts of men. So we see uh, the particulars of John Day, John's day, the person God sent, the man and his means... And then number three, there's four here, so don't get too excited. Number three, the prescription God gave. So watch this now. I'm going somewhere. So John begins preaching. Amen. Verse three, and he came into all the country about Jordan preaching. Down to verse 17, gives us the content of his message. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, more of that. But here's the question. Now, now this, is, this is so important too. It's not only the fact of preaching, it's also the what of preaching. Right. Well, I, I go to this church, I, I used to go to this liberal church, and they preach, they spend about an hour. What are they saying? Right. Amen. Are they giving you Bible? Are they giving you the whole counsel of God? Amen. Are they only saying certain things and avoiding certain things? Then you shouldn't go to that church. Guess what? You know, this book cuts me as much as it cuts you. Amen. I'm not sitting on some podium here looking down like I've arrived. I have not. And this book cuts me again and again. Amen. And the easy thing to do is say, you know what, I just don't want to talk about that area. But we need it. Amen. We need every area. And so what did John preach about? What did it include? What was the substance of his preaching? Three things real quick. The first one is this. Uh, regeneration. Look at verse 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remissions of sin. Right. Now, what does that mean? You see, the Jews understood from the Old Testament that ceremonial cleansing of the priest. They understood the washing at the laver before they went into the tabernacle and to the temple and places where they had to bathe in the Old Testament priesthood. And John, that's not what John's preaching about here. Right. John was preaching a baptism of repentance. You say, what is that? In other words, he was preaching about a baptism, an immersion that is administered after a person trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior. In other words, you get saved first and then you get right. baptized. Amen. And by the way, baptism is not a means of salvation. Right. It is the first step of obedience after salvation. It is a public profession that you have trusted Jesus Christ Amen. as Savior. But notice he, what is, what's he doing here is this. He's making clear what the gospel is. It's not some sort of washing. It's not your relation to Abraham, he says later. It's none of that. It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord. That's the message of the, of the Bible. Amen. There's not a lot of churches today that preach a clear message of salvation. Right. We all need to give your life to God. Anybody not give their life to God yet? Anybody at all? Don't you want to give your life over to the Lord? That's not Bible. Right. We don't give anything to Him Amen. until after we're saved. We give our life to Him. But there's nothing I can give to Him that's going to earn my salvation. Right. I'm a sinner. I'm destined for hell because right. of my sin. Amen. Jesus was my substitute on the cross of Calvary. And I admit, yes, I'm a sinner. Amen. And I need Lord. Jesus to save me because I can't save myself. Right. And if I don't, I'm going to die and spend an eternity in hell. That's right. what the Bible says. Preacher, you said the word. You said hell. Amen. I think you even said sins. People don't like those words. We don't use those today. You know, we've all done things wrong and turn your life to Jesus. That's not what John was saying. Right. Amen. He preached regeneration. Amen. And he did something else. He also, his preaching included not only regeneration, it included rebuke. 
he says in verse 7, imagine this. You get up one morning and say, you know, I'm going to church here. Let me just, let me just turn on the religious station. I don't, know, I don't even know what they are. I don't watch them, okay? Don't, don't shout it out. <laughs> Please, we'll bring you to the confession booth later. And here comes some liberal guy up there all smiling. And he gets up and says, good morning. The Bible, the Word of God. Never, 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 money, whatever he says, right? And then all of a sudden he says, Oh, generation of vipers! Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Amen. You'd be like, what happened to that dude? Right. <laughs> but that was John. Right. Amen. He rebuked them. Praise the Lord. He revealed to them who they truly were. He didn't hold back. He didn't mince words. Amen. He didn't compromise. It wasn't a God loves you and you're a champion type message. John called sin, sin. Right. And notice, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance uh, and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. In other words, you're not getting to heaven because of your relationship to Abraham. Right. Uh, God is able to raise, uh, uh, to take these stones and raise up children uh, uh, to Abraham. And now the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Uh, every tree therefore which bringeth forth not good uh, forth good Good fruit is shewn down and cast into the fire. Right. Amen. That, was, that was a strong message. So he preached rebuke. It right. included rebuke. But then it also included repentance. It's interesting what he says. Um, verse 3 he talks about he preached the repentance for the remission of sin. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind that brings forth a change of actions. So when someone's lost, repentance is necessary. Amen. Because when you're lost, you think, I'm good enough to get to heaven, and I don't need to, I don't need to be saved, and, and all that. But when you realize you're lost and you want to turn to Christ, you have to change your mind about what you thought about yourself, about the Savior, right. and about salvation. Amen. And you're changing your mind. And when you do repent and trust Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, the evidence of salvation, not the means of salvation, but the evidence of salvation is a changed life. Right. Not that we're perfect. We're, we're far from perfect. We have a lot of work to do. But there is a change that takes place. And that's what John is saying here. As a matter of fact, they say, well, what do we do? Uh, he says, well, here's the evidence. If you're uh, the people in verse 10, say, what shall we do? They said, well, start giving. Giving, because we're all takers before we were saved. Verse 12, he talks to the publicans, the tax collectors. Be honest and fair. Verse 14, he talks to uh, the soldiers. Uh, uh, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. What he's saying here, if you truly have repented and trusted Jesus as your Savior, then your life's going to change. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's going to change. Right. That was a part of his message. By the way, that's supposed to be part of all of our messages at right. preach. Amen. 2 Timothy 4 2, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering doctrine, and uh, repent uh, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so the point is this is that they truly believe something, there will be a distinct uh, uh, and evident change in their life. Right. Amen. That shows what God has done in our hearts. Amen. And this is what John is saying. Don't we say the same thing? Don't we believe that when you come to a church service, it's not just about nodding your head to the preacher's statements and doctrines and then right. going home and Amen. living like the world and having two separate lives, a church right. life and a, and a public life? Uh, that's not what it's about. Amen. It, it, the preaching, if it's truly changed our lives, guess what? We're going to go home and we're going to make changes in our lives and we're going to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're going to begin getting things out of our lives that God is displeased with uh, and putting the things into our lives that God wants to be present. Right. Amen. That's what preaching is supposed to do. Amen. And that's what he preached about. Amen. And that's the way it ought to be if we're going to see... God help people. Amen. You see, the greatest danger, and I said this before, I'll say it one last time, and I'm, I'm wrapping it up here. The greatest danger in the liberal church is not necessarily what they say. Right. Amen. 
I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, they preach the gospel there. Okay, well, what else do they preach? Right. Dress. Do they preach about dress? Men dressing like men, women just do they do that? Do they do they, they preach about alcohol? Right. Amen. Do they preach about music? Amen. I'll tell you the answer to that, they don't. Right. Because they don't want to offend people too much. Right. But I would you I would do you a disservice Amen. and I would stand before God right. for my ministry if I did not do my best right. to give you the whole counsel of God. Amen. God has something to say about everything in life. Right. And as preachers, it's our job to preach the Word, Praise the, Lord. the whole Word. Amen. That's going to fix us, Amen. and we need it. Right. And then notice what happens when we're done here. Not only the particulars of John's day, the person God sent, the prescription God gave. Notice the persecution John experienced. Right. Well, who do you think you are, Christ? Right. I'm not the Christ. I, I'm not the Christ. So that, that's, that's what they, they had asked him. And as the people, verse 15, were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ, he says, no, and I'm not the Christ. The Christ is coming after me. But he continued to preach. I like what he says in verse 18. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But what happened to John? Right. Well, persecution. Right. He was thrown in prison and would later be martyred because he preached the word. Amen. Now, I'm grateful in America for now. That's not happening. We still have guaranteed freedoms to preach, right. preach the word of God. But I hope you understand that the general consensus in the public and the general consensus from the liberal churches is they don't like people like us. Right. They don't want to hear what we have to say you know, that, that preach the Bible. And so they look down upon us. And so understand, we are, as a whole, we are going to be in the minority. Right. Amen. Amen. For the time will come, Paul said to Timothy, Amen. when they will not endure sound doctrine. They're going to get to the place, and I, we've gotten to the place. I don't want to hear it. I'm just going to go find a church that accommodates my lifestyle. And they do. And those churches will. And may I say so-called churches. Right. But you don't need that, and I don't need that. Amen. What I need and what you need is straight preaching from the Word of God. Right. What this world needs is straight preaching from the Word of Amen. God. That's what we need. That is God's remedy right. for man's ills. Right. So I ask you this morning, what's your attitude towards preaching? Spiritual people love it. They say, go on, preacher. Didn't even look at my watch. Didn't even realize you were running a few minutes late this morning. You keep Amen. going at it. Carnal people, come on, four points instead of three. An introduction, that story was way too long. My pot roast is in the crock pot. Stop already. This is what we need for our soul. We have to go a whole week uh, after tonight, Monday and Tuesday, uh, fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil. Right. And then Amen. again, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And we need to come in here Amen. and not get some little ditty. And not right. just get some little, well, let's just pray together and have some requests, and I'll share a verse with you. Or let's just meet online tonight, and I'll talk for 10 minutes. Don't worry, I won't take too much of your time. That's, that's what we've come to. We need... The preaching Amen. of God's Amen. word, Amen. unadulterated and uncompromised. Amen. That's what we need. And Amen. I hope you agree with that. Right. Right. Let's pray together.